Hello everyone, Helen Yu here at VMware Explore in Las Vegas. I'm here with Chris Wolf here, who is a global AI and advanced services uh, VCF, right? Mm -hmm. VMware Cloud Foundation at Broadcom. Yep. Hello, Chris. So nice to reconnect with you. You too, Helen. Yeah, last year, right, we spoke about responsible AI. At the time, you were the head of AI labs at VMware. So mm -hmm. what has changed since then? And can you talk to us a little bit about your new role and uh, what your primary focus on? Yeah, yeah. So uh, my role is leading the private AI business for the Cloud Foundation division at VMware and, uh, or, sorry, at Broadcom. Yeah. And um, uh, that's really focused on, you know, all aspects of delivering the product, the mm -hmm. technology, the product roadmap, you know, working with our product management team and marketing teams, as well as our sales organization on the go-to-market side, and uh, spending a lot of time meeting with leaders around the world to understand their requirements and make sure that we're driving a product that has the right market fit. You know, that sounds to me the most exciting role in the world, right? <laughs> it's uh, it comes with this amount of pressure, but yeah. it is very exciting. It's Absolutely. Good. Yeah. You know, at uh, during the keynote yesterday, there were quite a bit of exciting announcement. So I'd like to learn a little bit more about the breakthrough, right? VMware, what kind of breakthrough it has on AI, running AI workloads, as well as virtualized system on a bare metal. And uh, can you, how can you convince the skeptic of this? Yeah, I mean, really to convince the skeptic, it comes down to, I think, a couple things. If you say, who's the largest AI hardware provider in the mm -hmm. world, you'd say it's NVIDIA. Yeah. Um, NVIDIA invented the vGPU technology. So if you're to try to say there's any fault with virtualization, then you're you're trying to fault NVIDIA at the same time, right? <laughs> that, that doesn't make sense. So NVIDIA has been very committed to the vGPU roadmap. Mm -hmm. And when you start to virtualize not just the GPU, but then all of your hardware around it, mm -hmm. uh, you get massive consolidation benefits, you lower your power costs, you mm -hmm. need less power to your data centers. And that's a huge concern, right, with AI today is the power and cooling costs. So we can address that. And, and if you have a workload where you're like, you know what, I'm not so sure about vGPU, then we say, fine, we'll use pass through and you don't have to virtualize the GPU. So sometimes people don't know how many, how much flexibility they actually have. Mm -hmm. You know, I enjoy your TikTok, you know, yesterday, right? So I heard uh, private AI services now is included in VCF9. Wow. That's exciting. So talk to us a little bit about how automation works in VCF and then what changes that need that the company need to make to maximize the value? Yeah. So like if you step back, like why does automation matter? I think mm -hmm. that's a good place to start. When we talk to customers that are, have been doing say AI and bare metal, it could take them to take an AI application or a new AI model into production. If it's a really well run IT organization, maybe two weeks because it's, I have to download the right device driver for the accelerator. Mm -hmm. I have to figure out what the optimized kernels are for an AI model. I have to bring the model down. Yeah. I have to figure out replication or backup or how do I schedule to place the resources on my clusters. But with us, you have a VCF automation blueprint. I can just see what I need. I can hit go mm -hmm. and we will figure out where to put the workload, where it's most performance optimized, do the entire software stack. And that's just all automatic. And that's just, the, that's one piece of our solution, but it's a really powerful uh, capability for customers. You know, I can relate to that, right? Things have really changed. I'm extremely excited about strategic partnership with NVIDIA. I've been working with NVIDIA for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So tell us how this partnership will keep the data private, safe, you know, uh, secure and compliant, especially for highly in sensitive industries. Yeah, yeah. So, like, certainly there's lots of AI growth in the cloud, but what we've seen, and this was our thesis from the beginning of our journey, is that there's a huge market that requires the AI model to be brought on premises. So, that could be a manufacturing facility, it could be a hospital, uh, it could be a, a typical organization that has, say, private support documents mm -hmm. or they have private legal and contract documents. That, They're insurance company or yeah, perhaps, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or regulated industries, uh, public sector and government agencies mm -hmm. where uh, the, the data is just too important. And even if the data can leave, they may not want it to because they don't want to put it into some proprietary cloud where they have to pay egress costs just to get the data back. Mm -hmm. Right. So so these are all genuine concerns. And what we've built with NVIDIA is a solution that allows you to have flexibility to bring any AI model 
that you're looking to run anywhere that you're doing business, whether it's your own private data center, an edge site, one of our provider partners and so forth. I love that because you basically give customers the choice, right? Of hardware, of the AI model they want to run. Huh? So that's really cool. Yep. And, you know, I work with a lot of CIOs and CTOs navigating through digital transformation today. One of the biggest concerns they have, right, is I have existing footprint. Some of them have 300 plus systems already. They, when they run the AI or apps, they want to make sure they can coexist with the existing systems, how how do you make sure your customer running that don't that you don't slow the new adoption does not slow down what they already have today? Yeah, that's it's a good question. So for us, the key is when you look at trying to build AI in a silo, mm -hmm. what we often see from customers is that they bought this infrastructure and it is maybe 30, 40 percent utilized, might be mm -hmm. difficult to life cycle manage. They, they're having to recreate all of these operational challenges that they already have solved for their production apps. Yeah. So our value proposition is have the same set of tools and processes for all of your applications. Mm -hmm. It dramatically can lower your total cost of ownership. And then any capacity you have available, even in your AI clusters, I can use it for other workloads. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to be as resource efficient as possible. And if you're really excited about AI, then the best way to work on that is with us because we're going to reduce your AI costs and then that's going to allow you to do more different AI use cases that you may not have initially had budget for. Mm -hmm. You know, that V expert demo during the keynote really resonated with me, right? I love the fact that they were able to, within three minutes, demonstrate, illustrating what, how it works, everything. I can't wait to go to the hands-on lab right after this conversation. Let's go. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So let's talk about simplicity, right? When you talk about IT, the biggest challenge today, they have to relearn everything. Every time you adopt a new tool or new platform, they have to relearn everything. So how does VMware simplify uh, managing AI models so they don't have to relearn everything every time there's a change or redo things? regularly yeah yeah so for us um it's the same familiar tools that they already have uh we have very sophisticated technology for load balancing ai workloads that mm -hmm. our administrators have been using for close to the past 20 years and we just mm -hmm. continue to grow and evolve that technology and it, it's really important because all of the focus on ai is usually the gpus mm -hmm. but uh, the network requirements i have is going to vary based on the number of parameters i have in an ai model so I have to not just have the right GPUs, but the right network, the right memory, the mm -hmm. right storage, right? It's very complicated to do this well. Yeah. And so for our customers to be able to use these very mature tools that their most business critical applications have run on for a very long time to be able to onboard these new workloads, is huge. And now that we've integrated the services with our core platform, right? Customers can just light up these AI workloads mm -hmm. and that's going to be super exciting for them, I think. You know, that reminds me of the book you wrote 20 years ago, Virtualization from Desktop to Enterprise. And I wonder if you're going to write the next <laughs> book and for the, for the new era. Yeah, I, um, I, my, I, I wrote a bunch of books and then I had kids. Okay, and that's then, not uh, an excuse. No, it's, it's maybe it's not, but I mean, the irony of that virtualization book was I had published with uh, publishers such as Addison Wesley mm -hmm. at the time, and I had gone to them mm -hmm. and said, there's just going to be this new really important space called virtualization, and I want to publish a book on it. And they said, well, there's actually no market for that. Mm -hmm. It's niche. Nobody would read it. So I went to a smaller <laughs> publisher. Yeah. yeah, I went yeah. to a smaller publisher called A Press and said, this is the idea. And they said, this is awesome. We believe in it. You know, that book got published. And I think within two years, there's probably 40 books about virtualization that came my after goodness. that. Yeah. Congrats. So, yeah, yeah I, I like to joke that was kind of like my career highlight <laughs> was like that first book on virtualization. And it's been kind of a slow, steady downward trajectory. Well, that's another topic, another day. You know, I would love to learn more about it. You know, I came across this MIT study recently. It says 95% AI, especially on AI implementation, falling short. Only 5% really achieved accelerated revenue. Part of it because integration failure, right? Yeah. So what advice would you give companies who are on this journey with AI deployment? And then what are the uh, pitfalls they should avoid? Yeah, I, I mean, first, Take the lessons you learned from blockchain. Yeah. Like, you know, six years ago, everything was supposed to be this blockchain use case, right? And it, it wasn't where the database was fine. And it has to be the same thing with AI. Don't try to do AI for the sake of AI. Mm -hmm. 
like experiment, find the use cases that give you business value. Like when I talk to IT leaders, what they appreciate is we give very specific clarity. Like if you take your contact center where I can take my internal support documents and all of this internal information that maybe my call center agents are using to solve customer issues mm -hmm. and I can make them get access to that information quicker, they're closing support tickets faster. They're doing more support tickets in a week. It's a measurable efficiency gain uh, that I have with rolling out the AI technology. So what folks should be telling themselves is if I can't figure out how to measure the business value, mm -hmm. then maybe it's just not an AI application, right? Yeah. And that's not a use case and that's okay. So find the use cases where you have the value, focus there. Uh, the, the knowledge worker use cases, sometimes that can be a little difficult, but you, you don't have to go big on a hunch. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do a POC, figure out can I measure value or not? And if the answer is no, then maybe, maybe it's a good idea, but it's not the right time, yeah. right? So then you should wait. You know, that's music to my ear, right? That's the constant struggle with most of the company we work with. Uh, one, never you see an IT leader with business value in mind, that's where success starts. Yeah. So kudos to you. Well, we have to wrap up our conversation with um, the future, right? So let's talk about how are you with all these constant change evolving uh, AI models out there? How do you keep up with all these changes and especially from data sovereignty perspective? Yeah, yeah, I, that's a good question. So I think a couple of things. So first, like I've been long been a proponent of architecting for the expectation of change. So when we built our private AI platform, we built in resiliency to, if I want to change my accelerator, mm -hmm. I, I can do that. If I want to use a different AI model, I can do that. And like, if you look at like some of like the coding assistant wars, mm -hmm. like you'd say, well, hey, Gemini Pro is the best. And somebody would say, no, Claude's the best, right? And then GPT is saying, or OpenAI is saying, hey, this new GPT model is going to be the best. So mm -hmm. you're going to have this constant churn of best of breed. So you mm -hmm. need to have a platform that can allow you to uh, be able to embrace that change and be able mm -hmm. to pivot very quickly, which is what you can do with our solution. Mm -hmm. And then in the sovereign space, where we're really standing out is the customer owns the entire hardware and software stack or mm -hmm. the provider. And by entire, what I mean is even the control plane is something they own. It's resident in country or in their uh, physical data center. Uh, so if they do have concerns around privacy, around control, they don't have those concerns with us. Mm -hmm. They would have those concerns with some of our competitors. I saw you were up on stage showing the dashboard, even showed the red flag on the legal or compliance, right? So I thought it really cool to have that kind of bird's eye view of where you are, where you should really focus on uh, drilling into as an IT leader. To me, that kind of alignment is really resonated. No, thank you. And our customers, they really worry about safety and that's really where we focused. So being able to bring a model in, do your security scans, ensure that the safety guard rails are in place with the model, approve a select set of models for production. And then when you look at how you're collecting data, that's the other area where we really make sure it's secure. So I can grab my data sets, I can put in my role-based access controls. So people are only able to pass that data to a model that they mm -hmm. have access to and has been granted the appropriate permissions. So having those controls in place is what you need to be able to safely do AI for any type of enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's really phenomenal. So thank you so much, Chris. And every time we speak, I learn something from you. And thank you for uh, you know painting a clear picture on how Broadcom is really leading this transformation, especially for private cloud and enterprise AI. I hope we'll speak again next year and then look forward to learning more from you. I hope so too. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you.